it's gone two minutes. Should we kick off then? Kira? OK, yeah, happy to kick off. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, you're all very welcome to this latest uh, meeting of the Further Faster Urology Specialty Group. We've had a couple of these meetings so far, and I'm hoping that you'll find this one uh, of, uh, of interest to you. What we're going to do is Hamza is shortly going to give a presentation. Hamza, if you could just move on a slide there. Uh, just on a national update for uh, urology as a specialty and also showing data from um, from hospitals throughout throughout England. And then Andrew Dickinson, otherwise known as Dickey, is going to take us through um, the latest in relation to advice and guidance and PIFU. And, and following that, we're hoping to have Andy Elves from Shrewsbury and Telford, who's actually walked the walk uh, and has been doing this for some time will give us an insight into some of the some of the issues that he encountered as he developed it. So he'll be joining the meeting shortly. But we're going to kick off with you, Hamza, if you could take us through the um, the slides relating to the further faster and the national update. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Kieran. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Hamza. I'm the implementation manager in the national GERF team uh, now covering urology. So just look at some of this data. Most of this comes from the national waiting list minimum data set and our fi final slide. I'm sure you'll recognize is from model health system as well. So just as further in further faster um, in its impact overall, it has been going since around July last year now, and we've seen a really good change in the first two cohorts of trust that we were working with. So the orange line, uh, which is the cohort one of trust, which we started with in further faster, um, with their 52 week backlog across all TFCs and all ages, they've dropped down to about 63.1% now. Uh, see cohort two is at 86.8 with all other trusts now, which we're also calling cohort three, which is at 90.2%. And um, part of what Professor Briggs is trying to be looking at recently now is focusing on the 40 to 52 week backlog as well, um, particularly from the feedback we've had from, from the providers and services we're working with that we want to try and expand this um, as those numbers do start to decrease. Now, um, the lighter blue line is the line which you're looking at for 40 to 52 weeks and across all specialties we've actually seen that increase uh, over over the last year uh, currently sitting at about 113 uh, percent compared to 52 plus week waiters who are down to about 81.3 percent and we saw uh, we saw an increase just into the new year uh, after christmas for the 40 to 52 week backlog i've seen that has had a considerable increase which has stayed as well um, the big note for people is to try and where possible to be monitoring those long waiters because they will turn out to be your 52 weekers soon enough as well. Just to look at some of the specialty data. So firstly, just to look at the urology side. So we've seen that the 40 to 52 week uh, has not had uh, as an increase as it has uh, compared to all the specialties, that it just went up to about 103.8%. We've actually seen a decrease down for the 52 week waiters, week waiters to about 74.9% as well. So still seen a good decrease there. So um, particularly looking at adults as the main focus for the specialty, um, this is looking at cohort one and two and how it's gone nationally overall. And we've seen a good decrease across uh, all all the three all of the three cohorts. But again, really good to see a huge decrease from 100 down to 53.6% uh, since this program started for cohort one. Similarly, down to 73.6% for cohort two and 89.4% for all the trusts nationally. Uh, so, so I feel that's a big mix of all the work that's gone into into this, whether it's the very specialty specific information, but also some of the general work from doing with trust around reducing your DNAs, increasing PIFUs and things like that as well. Um, and looking at it broken down for each trust as well. Unfortunately, we've only got the data for cohorts one and two, uh, the ones we've been looking at. Uh, this is showing the change for each trust within this specialty from when the program started from 9th of July to the most recent data, which is published for the 5th of May here. So, uh, so hopefully you can find your trust within there. And it's ordered by the percentage change, but that's not as significant to see. So as you can see, for example, United Lincolnshire, it shows it's had a 950% increase, but it's only by 19 patients. So it's actually not as big, but unfortunately, because they only started with two, it shows it's quite a considerable increase there. Um, we've seen a lot of good to good increases with the trust throughout these. Um, one thing to ask is that for the trust is, you may have found that they, they've had a big increase that they either don't recognise or that they're struggling with. This is certainly the group to reach out for and we can really help try and support that one. It's not through the knowledge that we have here within our team already, but certainly sharing best practice from all the trusts we have presented as well. 
Lastly, just to look at the PIFU utilisation rate. So this comes from model health system. Um, the Between the two trend lines there, you can see the grey line, which is for the faster median for all the providers, compared to the national median, which is the black line there. And you can see we do have a positive increase compared to the national for the further faster trust, which is good to see. On the right hand side, ordered for uh, our cohorts one and two for all the PIFU values which are reported through the model health system as well. And I'm not saying that the bigger it is, the better it is, because it certainly does go hand in hand with your discharge rates, uh, which certainly leads us perfectly on to our next talk today. Dickie, over to you. Thanks, Hamza. Um, and thank you everybody for inviting me. I'm Andrew Dickinson. I've been involved in the project with advice and guidance and PIFU for GERF for the last year or so, but I, my interest in this has gone back almost 10 years. And I have to um, take the opportunity just to thank my colleague, Richard Pearcy in Plymouth, who really did set up the advice and guidance pre-choice triage that we've been running in Plymouth for 10 years. So my talk, I just want to outline the background, show a little bit about advice and guidance variation, run you through the development of the process, give you an overview of the templates, not only of advice and guidance, but uh, also the PIFU templates and some tips and insights and where we can take it forward uh, in the future. Next slide, please. So this picture that some of you may or may not know is uh, a Lowry uh, painted of a Manchester hospital outpatients way, way back. One could argue things haven't really changed very much. This is over 100 years old and we still have a waiting area. We still have patients waiting, um, waiting to be seen face to face. And perhaps that's the real stimulus to think about outpatient transformation and to think of a strategy for the NHS going forward for over the next five to 10 years. And I was lucky enough to be involved in that strategy. And I thought I'd just give you a little glimpse of what we've been just talking about and how we're going about it, whether it's relevant to advice and guidance and BIFU before it is uh, published within the next few weeks. Next slide, please. So the vision was really how to transform how and by whom timely and productive outpatient care is delivered. We know that this model of the patient seeing the doctor may not be sustainable going forward. The volume of work that we're now doing means that we need to think outside the box. We need to think about how we can deliver more timely access and improved delivery by using different people and perhaps different functions of care, perhaps using advice and guidance to its maximum, using patient initiated follow up, improving the flow through the system. It isn't all about the patient seeing the consultant. We really need to get the right person in front of the right clinician, the right healthcare professional to improve productivity across the board so that we as a consultant get to see the patients we need to see. Our brilliant clinical nurse specialists get to see the patients that they are best dealing with, that the patients are appropriately managed in primary care and specialist care is only when it's need needed. So there are the three drivers, the three aims. And deep down in this, as always has been within the NHS, is to try increase the amount of prevention. I think that's a long term aim. I think we've got a much better chance of improving flow and improving productivity before we really get into the nitty gritty of outcomes and prevention. Next slide, please. So this graph really shows what we're really wanting to do more of in the new strategy, more personalization, more prevention, empowering patients, using a modern way of approaching delivery, doing less barriers, one size fits all, waiting lists, clinicians working in silos. So this is the strategy and let's see how it all fits together. And next slide, please. And the latest operational planning guidance gives us some sort of insight about where NHSE wants to push things towards. So they are very keen in the planning guidance, which many of you have already seen, to get advice and guidance slightly further up the agenda. So they really want to ensure that all ICBs have an established approach to utilize specialist divide models. So they are providing facilities, resources to get the ICBs to engage, to get the, the whole um, process of advice and guidance more evenly spread across the country. Next slide, please. 
So that was really to create alignment across the NHS. So the need to see the uniformity to identify and deliver good evidence based interventions. And I hope by the end of this talk, you can see that we provided good evidence based interventions for advice and guidance in urology. So this is again also in the operating planning guidance that the NHSE wishes to drive this agenda through PCTs and trusts. Next slide, please. So really their objectives are to support the clinical and financial efficiency across primary and secondary care interface. In other words, they are looking at how they're going to pay for this. They want to improve waiting times, reduce the waiting time to go. One of our big risks is our non-RTTs. So those patients that are sitting between primary care and secondary care that really nobody quite knows the risks there. Advice and guidance helps mitigate that. So at least you've had some form of contact as a primary care physician with a secondary care specialist about what you may be able to do while they're waiting. So it should improve choice, but particularly it should be able to provide um, better care in the place closer to home. So more timely diagnostics, right place, right time. Next slide, please. So our patient transformation within the GERF program has been well established. I wrote the original guide for outpatient transformation, looking at the pillars of advice and guidance, virtual clinics, uh, remote monitoring, one-stop clinics, and pl uh, patient-initiated follow-up. But as this, div this guide has been taken up, there was a need uh, to focus more particularly on the two areas that I think could be done, not better, but perhaps more equally across the country. And the first area was advice and guidance templates, and the second was the use of um, patient-initiated and remote monitoring templates. So that there's a standard of care that we would like to provide across urological patients across the whole of NHSC. That was the, that was the aim to do, and i now explain how we did it and what we've come up with. Next slide, please. So what are the advantages of advice and guidance? Well, for patients, it's earlier access to specialist advice. So they may be giving that advice rather than sitting on a waiting list to be seen a year down the line and be told exactly the same thing that they could have been done in a letter and told by their GP. This advice at the moment is very concentrated on specialist advice going back to the primary care physician, almost certainly in the near future, we will be writing directly to patients so that they are involved in this conversation. They will have access to the letter that you've written, but we must need to think going forward that this may be the alternative to do. It saves time and money. We're all acutely aware of the green agenda. If you can manage a patient closer to home, that must be better for the environment. And actually you can then get patients straight to test and therefore they're much more prepared for their specialist uh, appointment in the hospital because their tests are done, you make that a much cleaner single one stop. It's better for primary care because it's rapid access. It's a really good educational resource. GPs are having to keep up to date with the huge changes in the health service, and this is a prov provides them with some really good educational support from the urological perspective. It also potentially reduces fewer repeat attendances for patients just waiting for an outpatient appointment. Secondary care, it reduces unnecessary attendances. There are many patients that you could have dealt with by telephone or by, or by letter initially, which you don't necessarily need to come and see you. It does shorten that wait for consultation. It allows you to get the right patients into the right clinic and really provide a decent uh, triage and it gets you that ability to pre-investigate. Next slide, please. So here's the variations of use of specialist advice. The gray boxes are the cohorts one and two, and you can see it's pretty well, pretty varied. Um, the national median is 27.2. So the cohorts one and two don't seem to be doing as well as perhaps we should or expect. I think there is room for all of us to get improvement in our advice and guidance across the patch. Next slide, please. So here's the trends 
it is going up and down. It's very variable, but on the upward trend. But again, the median for cohort one and two, or particularly for one, is less than one would expect. So I think there is, uh, there are certainly opportunities for all of us to look at how we're doing it and whether we can improve it or even start it. And hopefully these templates will give you the confidence, having been um, ratified by GERT and by BAUS, to start the process off with your patients in urology. Next slide, please. So how do we go about it? I was appointed chair and I'd already been the outpatient transplantation lead. I put an expert working group together, which covered not only England, but also included Scotland. We did feel that there was a lot of benefit to learning from devolved nations and seeing how their processes go. We drew up a list of topics because we knew that those are the things that patients or GPs were often asking about and could be managed in a different way. It's almost exclusively benign um, urology. The cancer has been separated out because it goes through a different process. So we looked at um, a series of responses we put together. We did some initial editing. We were really lucky. We had three really good motivated GPs who gave us incredibly useful feedback so that they felt that they were owning the problem along with us so that we could manage it in a way that would help primary care and not be um, an adversarial thing of that in feeling of pushing work back into their domain. It's not that like that. It's to getting the right patient in the right place at the right time. Editing that, and now we're into engagement, release, and communication. But the really important thing from this slide is this is a living document. We would love to change it. There are lots of really good ideas out there that I haven't been able to tap into straight away. So I really would like the feedback from you all and make these advice and guidance templates, these PIFU templates, um, better and improve with time. Next slide, please. So as I was the chair, we were involved groups. We had both uh, Baus and Bowne involved. The GPs are, are named on, on the group. Very importantly, we involved trainees. It's the urological trainees of the future that are going to be need to carrying this on. It's really important that they're involved um, at the beginning so they start understanding the rationale and the reason for doing it. And as you can see, the consultant urologists could spread across the country. Next slide, please. So we came up with 17 templates. This isn't tablets of stone. There are plenty of others that I hadn't thought of that you may out there think of, and I'd love to see them. The, these are the 17 we came up with and wrote in a, a particular way. Um, they cover a great deal of things. Very interesting. Some of the GPs said, well, why do you need a template on this? We would never see it, which just showed to me that there's a variation of urological service and urological insight and urological knowledge across the country. So some ICBs will never need to be dealing with trial without catheter. Others will. So there, there's a good good spread of all all um, um, procedures and all likely diagnosis in this group. Next slide. Next slide, please. So the starting example was what we do in Plymouth. It was a letter to the doctor giving them an idea of what's going on with a little bit at the end, just explaining that if they can't manage the patient, they can re-refer. Re we use the RAS system, so we don't have a two-way conversation with them. Those are using the ERS advice and guidance can have a two-way conversation. And I would really strongly encourage everybody to go down that route because the fact you can have a two-way conversation is really important, particularly if the GP has ticked the box for onward referral, but you just need a little bit more information or tests. The classic being chronic retention hasn't done the renal function. You're going to need to see the patient. But without the renal function, you can't prioritize that properly. So a referral a request back to the GP to check is a really good and useful thing. This letter was really looked at by the group decision and the GPs came up with some great ideas. They wanted, given the time pressures, they needed quick, snappy bullet points. I need to know exactly what to do. I need to know to do three things that I need to do. I also need to know when I should be referring back or whether I should prioritize this as a two week wait. Very good points, but as we said, as the urologists, we're starting to notice increasing number of non-GP referrals into the system, pharmacy, paramedics, nurse specialists. Nothing wrong with that, 
but the quality or the understanding of the problem is perhaps a little less and therefore there's a real opportunity to develop educational material for them so that they make a better referral the next time around. So that's how we moved towards the, the templates which we then designed. Next slide please. We came up with the colour coding. So the grey is really the standard information. Dear doctor, thank you for the referral, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. The green bits were the bullet points. This is what you need to do quickly. You can read this one paragraph and manage the patient. The reds were, if this is the case, this needs to be referred on, or if this happens in the future, please refer back. The blue was much more education, putting in web uh, website addresses to give them some information about patient information leaflets, Guide, nice guidelines, etc. So it allowed a little bit more of an educational approach. Next slide, please. So the new template looked at um, hemospermia, the, the key things that they should do a digital or vertical examination. They should um, make sure it's not hematuria, that the, the scrotal examination is normal. Then a little bit about if it's hematuria, it needs to go straight into two week wait, as with the PSA. But a little bit of education, it can take two, three months to get better. It's a benign condition. It just needs reassurance. So that's how we started to form the new templates across the 17 ones that we produced. Next slide, please. So tips, personalised to a specific target. It, you, This is a copy and paste, but be careful because there may be a very specific question the GP is asking and it's worth reading the letter and just adapting the copy and paste so that you are in answering the question he's asking or he or she is asking be concise highlight the actions because they don't have a lot of time they don't want to read a whole page of a4 they just want to see what to do and they're adaptable these are living lot documents you can download them in a word you can butch your own bits that the trust need to make them user friendly for your own trust and your own icb there's some really good insights into the in the document, the medical legal reassurance about who owns what at which part of the pathway. Your balancing information should be succinct and sufficient. It's good, a good thing to do, but won't necessarily show up in the data. You may find that you get more referrals because people want to have more advice um, and you may take a while for the number of referrals to stabilize out. Next, next slide, please. So that's the templates for advising guidance, which the majority of the work was done. But we also looked at some PIFU templates, of which we produced 10. We looked at the two sorts of PIFU. So that's the open appointment short term PIFU, where you define a period of time. And the classic example is bladderette flow obstructive surgery follow up. So you give the patient some detail of what they may be looking for, poor flow ongoing frequency urgency and continence after three months and saying to them if you have any of those problems you can contact us but at the point of six months we will discharge you no clinical review they are just taken off the system so it gives them their safety net to come into the system if they have the symptoms the second is a more long-term PIFU and we can use that as a stones example but we know patients who have recurrent stones they don't want to go to the back of the queue they know their stone problem they know it's going to be a, a, a stone that needs probably needs treating so you give them a contact number and say if you get increased numbers of stone pain infections hematuria give us a ring we will get back to you we will organize a scan and see you as necessary but the reassurance to them is that at the end of two years for sake of argument that's what we chose in Plymouth we will organize a CTKUB check your stone status and then contact you with a non face-to-face review either by telephone or by letter. You can then carry on the PIFU or you could discharge them at that point. So they're the three, the two main things, open appointment, long-term PIFU, and the 10 templates are written vary depending on whether it fits better with an open appointment or whether it fits better with a long-term. Next, next slide, please. Remote monitoring is really important. We would do it really well for cancer, but I just thought these two examples for renal 2F, uh, Bosniak 2F cysts. The top one is the Plymouth one, and we tend to follow up for five years. Why we've chosen that, it's historical, perhaps. The Scottish one below, 
they're doing it for slightly less. So again, this is a living document and it really depends on how you feel about doing this within your trust and within your ICB and your area. These are really good for clinical nurse specialists to guide them through that. So we've done them for cystectomy and prostate cancer, renal cancer and renal 2, Bosnic 2F cysts. If you've got other examples of remote monitoring, please let us know and we'll put them into the, um, into the templates. Next slide, please. So there's the link for it on Futures Workspace. Um, you may want to take a quick photograph of this slide so that you've got the link, um, a screenshot. Um, it's all available in there to download and use as you wish. Next slide, please. So just before I say thank you, I just thought we'd put a yin and yang symbol up. It is a symmetry between PIFU and advice and guidance. Advice and guidance is a really important part of our patient transformation, but so is PIFU. They work together and they work um, as almost a continuum. If you've got really good advice and guidance, you can be very much more confident with your patient initiated follow up because if there's a problem, and they won't necessarily come back to you and phone your number you've given. They'll go back to their GP. GP has access quickly back to you so you can have a quick turnover between 24 and 48 hours. I think that's really important. The take home message of all of this is follow up is by exception. We should be primarily discharging our follow ups. Don't use PIFU as a safety net if you can avoid it. Thank you very much. Dickie, that is just a great overview of uh, of the topic. It's much appreciated. I have uh, posted the link into the chat so that people can click on that and move through it. Uh, but I'd like to open it up for a couple of questions, and there are two that I think come come to mind. Um, in your experience in terms of running this in Plymouth, job planning for the clinicians who are doing advice and guidance and how you've addressed that? Um, yeah, it's not for everybody. Uh, is a particular sort of person that likes doing environment guidance. There is a risk element. It is so much easier to see every single patient face to face, but sometimes that is just not going to be possible. So there has to be a particular sort of person that likes doing the advice and guidance and enjoys the time spent doing it. So in Plymouth, there are 12 consultants and five of us do advice and guidance. So we do it on a rotor and we do it every day. So our turnaround is 24, 24 hours, unless somebody forgets, in which case it's 48, but it's normally 24 hours. We are paid a PA for it. We get 0.8 of a PA for the advice and guidance we do during that day. I do it in, ha in time, so I'm paid at PA rate. The others do it as extra, so they are paid a little bit more. But eventually, as we even this all out, it all will be within time. So that's the model we've chosen. There's an alternative model of being paid per advice and guidance letter, but we felt the most important thing was the timely turnaround. So we are timetabled every day to do it for for the 52 weeks of the year, minus the bank holidays, etc. Yeah, and and given a session, how how many bits of advice and guidance do you think people would normally be able to deliver? We we are doing a about 20 or so letters on average. Okay. And um, the second question I wanted to ask, we have one comment from, from Sarah, which was uh, just would be interested to see how the data changes uh, as advice and guidance is, is being adopted. But the question I wanted to ask was in relation to the GP relationship and whether you being well established, this has been well taken up by your general practitioners. It's very rare that a GP doesn't like this particularly if you provide a quick turnaround system. And what they really don't like is sending advice and guidance and five weeks later not having a reply. And that isn't acceptable either side of the conversation. So you've got to be quick and turning around. It's really interesting. It does mix with productivity and the, the data. So the number of referrals we get from senior, well-established GPs is small. But we are now seeing them a lot more from locums, from trainees and other groups. So our our diversion rate, sending them back, has been about 30, 25 to 30 percent over the last 10 years. And it's pretty static. Okay. So it does mean that it's worth continuing long term. 
Now, a couple of units nationally have stopped taking referrals and insist that all patients come through advice and guidance. Do you have a, a view on that? I think that's probably the one of the better ways of doing it because it's single point of access and it must be better. But the flip side is that you've got to provide a really decent service to your primary care uh, colleagues, otherwise it won't work. So it has to be job planned properly. You've got to get the right people who want to do it. it I don't think it necessarily needs to sh sit with Hot Week because it tends to get pushed aside if you're very busy. This does take time. And to do it properly, you have to read the letters. You have to think about it. You have to go back into your ERS and check that the system, that, that your patient information is correct. Okay. And Sarah has come back in. So Davin has made a nice comment about uh, this being this being brilliant. So thank thank you for the, for that. But Sarah's asked, I think, an important question: is how do you how do the coding team charge for advice and guidance letters if the letter isn't touching the PaaS system? Uh, that I'm not sure about. We have an arrangement for being paid the equivalent to a new appointment for every letter we divert back. Okay, so this is an evolving situation, and we'll yeah. see, see, yeah. see how it but goes. But again, on. that's what I come back okay. to the operational planning guidance. That's why NHSE are involved. They don't want the ICBs not to be involved in this because of a funding problem. They want to work that through and get the system properly set up and resourced. So consultants and primary care physicians are paid appropriately for doing the work, yeah. and the money passes between the two. Okay. okay. So I think that's an opportune time really to move to Andy. So Andy is based in Shrewsbury and Telford and has been doing something similar to, to you, Dickie, for some, some time. So he's going to give us an insight into some of the, the issues that he's encountered. Uh, Andy, thanks very much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much for inviting me. So I'm a urologist in rural Shropshire. Uh, we have a fairly diverse population with the urban element being in Telford and then a very rural population extending out into Wales. And what I would like to share with you really is, is an implementation or an implementing process around our single point advice and guidance. And it's very much in the present tense. This is a project we started 2020. Uh, we got in a position to launch last year and we're still just feeling our way with it. So hopefully by sharing some of our successes and our mistakes, um, that'll be helpful and useful to you uh, in your local areas too. Next slide, please. So if we go back to the context and the why for doing this, uh, we had a waiting time for routine outpatients of 30 months. We had a very small substantive workforce. We were relying upon a lot of locums, which brings with it its own problems around follow-ups. Uh, it was post-COVID, everyone was feeling rather fatigued and there was a limited appetite for waiting list initiatives. So we didn't really have a choice, but to review our services and make changes. And this was one of them. Next slide, please. So if we go back to 2023, when we launched this, uh, we were about 80 uh, advice and guidance requests a month. Then we were certainly below the median. Over the last 12 months, we've changed that position in a very positive way. We're now at about uh, 100, 220 uh, advice and guidance requests a month, and, the med and we're above the median. And we've got around about a 40% diversion rate at the moment. Next slide, please. So the ambition or the vision was really to have uh, all of our um, referrals or advice and guidance coming through a single point service, ERS, uh, and to use the advice and guidance platform to deliver that. Uh, and there's a lot of material here that Dickie's already highlighted around the benefits to doing this. Uh, we would reduce our outpatient demand. We would manage to increase the one-stop utilization. Uh, and that then feeds into PIFU. Uh, we can optimise the virtual opportunity by recognising as the request comes in, which clinic is going to be most appropriate. And in a very rural environment, uh, reducing travelling, particularly for our elderly patients, is really key. Uh, it's going to reduce the waiting times if we don't see so many because we don't need to. We could divert them appropriately back through primary care. It grows communication within the health economy between primary and secondary care. And certainly within our patch, that's become quite strained over the years. 
we're very resource limited. It's led to an us and them as to who should do the work or where the work lands. And so this is an opportunity to build those relationships again and, and relaunch that link and communication between primary and secondary care. We shouldn't forget the back office staff. Uh, by using ERS as an electronic platform, our secretaries were not going to have to be printing off letters. They were not going to be have to typing uh, letters back and then read re-delivering them through advice and guidance. So this landed very well with our secretarial workforce and they were a significant lever in getting the adoption of the electronic platform agreed by the consultant workforce. And then, of course, we have the more soft uh, osmosis education of GPs about problems. And as Dickie's highlighted, the way you see your benefits and advice and guidance won't always be in reduced referrals, because as time goes on and the consistent me me message is delivered, GPs will begin to understand how to manage things so they can do it quickly within primary care themselves. Next slide, please. So we had a very simple plan, perhaps a little naive at the outset. Um, we get engagement from both primary and secondary care with uh, e-referrals like Dickey. We have two uh, referral assessment services, neither of which enable the GPs to use ERS and advice and guidance directly. So we had to have a fairly large scale uh, engagement with primary care to get them on board using our digital colleagues. Equally within secondary care, we were not using the electronic platform. And again, that was education and training and investment in time. Going paperless was key. It's much more efficient and it helps the secretarial workforce when they've already got a lot of work to do anyway. We also felt uh, that it would be useful to have an agreement between primary and secondary care as to what were reasonable tests to get done up front within primary care. Uh, and in this regard, getting the local medical committee and primary care on board is important, as well as the primary care uh, ICB representative. And then we developed a series of standardised primary care referral uh, templates so that we knew what the problem was coming in, we knew the GPs knew what was expected of them, and then we had standardised advice templates where appropriate to go back out to GPs. And it's it's really quite great to see that we've now got that uh, done by GERFT uh, on a much more thorough uh, series of problems than we, we had when we set off here. So that's really helpful to have those templates available now. Next slide, please. So it's really quite simple methodology, engage your stakeholders, agree what process, pathways and advice we were going to deliver. We took the template from Hereford, so steel with pride, no harm in that. And importantly, pulling in the influencers, which was the ICB board and GERFT through Dickie Kieran. Um, the implementation plan um, looks fairly simple and straightforward. Starting off, we were going to leave advice and guidance running parallel with triage through ERS referrals. We were then going to claim we'd closed it. And then after six months, we were then going to close the referral pathway and just have advice and guidance and gather uh, feedback from both primary care and patients as we went along. I'd have to say we haven't actually got as far as July 2023 before our primary care colleagues decided um, they were not entirely happy. Um, next slide, please. So stakeholders, not rocket science, um, engage them, engage them early and be aware that the people you engage with who appear to be representing primary care may not be necessarily all of the voice or all of what you need to listen to. Next slide, please. So within secondary care, I don't think anybody would be surprised by the issues raised by colleagues within secondary care. Dickie's already alluded to them major concerns around medical legal responsibility, accountability, and particularly into the concerns about missed cancers. However, there is very robust guidance around uh, responsibility and accountability now. This wasn't a new process that we were looking at, it was just the way we were delivering it and the breadth of delivery we were looking for. We also, of course, had a fairly significant backlog of two and a half years before we got seen in clinics. So if you did have a malignant condition hiding in your benign triage pathways, um, you are not going to benefit them by using the system we had at that time. And importantly, where there were problems and concerns, bringing in GERFT was, was really helpful 
in, in getting the message across and getting the team on board. Job planning, again, Dickie's spoken about this and has been, uh, Kieran raised it in the questions, absolutely pivotal. Uh, we did look at what we projected in terms of demand. We looked at a range of options and the team very much decided how they wish to change it. We were, when we were at four uh, advice and guidance a day, doing it within our uh, on-call week, or our on-call session as hot activity. It was felt that as the activity increased, that wouldn't be sustainable. And we adopted a different pattern uh, where time was carved out of clinics as well as some on-call activity. That hasn't been as successful as we would have wished. One needs to remember that people are on study leave, sick leave, annual leave, bank holidays. Uh, and as Dickie says, if you don't get the turnaround rapid and effective, then you will lose the primary care engagement and the service is not robust and it's not the high quality that we would wish. Next slide, please. So the actual issues we had, smart cards have been a big thing, getting them to work, getting them to continue working um, and training people up to use them. The platform itself is very simple, it might be a bit slow, but it's very simple and easy to use. Working uh, to get a, a job plan that's agreed continues to be uh, an area of discussion. And I think Dickey really has hit it on the head. Um, it's not for everybody. And I think if you've got enough substantive consultants, then having a bespoke group who are accepting of the risk and enjoy doing it is the way to go. And then plan the, the demand based ar around the number of referrals or requests you're getting. Next slide, please. Within primary care, again, similar issues, but a lot of noise uh, around concerns about offloading of work from secondary care. We thought we might have negated those by uh, having agreed templates. In reality, that hasn't transpired uh, as not everybody was completely on board. Uh, capability has also been another area. We are, I think, now looking at a workforce within primary care that is both junior GPs as well as um, support from other areas such as advanced nurse practitioners, pharmacists, and we need to recognise that in the advice that we're giving. And I think that's um, delivered very nicely in the new GERF templates in a way that uh, we don't always perhaps do when we respond on the hoof in an advice and guidance request. Use VRS, we had to un unpick that one because GPs were not used to using it, but again, it was about liaising with the back office staff uh, and they saw it as a very big plus moving to the platform. Uh, and then the additional time it would take them uh, and the extra work really feeds back into the second point around where the work balance sits between primary and secondary care in your pathways. Next slide, please. So here's actually some feedback from the primary care survey that we recently completed. Um, and you can get the tone for, of some of the feedback that there are quite significant anxieties about this being a way of offloading work into primary care. Building those relationships, that trust, uh, those conversations uh, is really important and that's a piece of work we'll be restarting shortly on the back of this survey and, and information. And again, if you ask GPs, does it help them? The answer is they're not very convinced by advice and guidance. Next slide, please. If, however, you ask, do you think it benefits the patient, you get a very different answer. Uh, so that's quite an important feature to bring out in your conversations with your primary care colleagues if you're struggling to get engagement. They, they will do it for the benefit of the patient, uh, and it is then about meeting their needs around prompt turnaround and appropriate advice that's been agreed and not outside their area of expertise. Next slide, please. So where are we now? We've doubled the number of uh, referrals coming in through advice and guidance, although we've still got two systems, both the referral ERS and advice and guidance. Uh, and hopefully we've got some changes in the ICB where we'll be able to push that one further forward. Next slide, please. So what's been the impact? Uh, I think it's been difficult to interpret the data. When you look at your utilization data that's available on Model Hospital, it's about the number of outpatient appointments 
the new ones in any given month. Uh, and if you're having a push with uh, outsourcing for new referrals, that's going to distort the data. We do seem to have a downward trend in terms of referrals against an upward trend in the number of advice and guidance requests. Um, but I think the, the relationship between the two is probably rather more complicated than a simple flip and change. Next slide, please. So, as Dicky said, and I think this slide probably demonstrates and illustrates it quite nicely, um, engagement, willingness and enthusiasm for advice and guidance does not is not the same for everybody. Not everybody's an enthusiast. Uh, and we have some people who have perpetual problems with their card uh, and their contribution is therefore fairly limited. And we have some people who have a solution which is to really just accept everything as referrals. So as part of our conversations around job planning, I think we're going to have to have a conversation around who actually wants to do this um, in order to get the best for our primary care colleagues as well as the department. Next slide, please. So lessons learned. Uh, advice and guidance originates in primary care. Uh, so while we've got the patient in mind, it's the GPs we need to be attentive to and we won't create change unless we engage them successfully. And that's quite a long journey as we're experiencing. Get the stakeholders on board early, understand the local politics, the organisational memories, the issues, the red lines, and try and navigate those as best you can using the support of GERFT and the ICB. ERS is actually an easy platform to use uh, and it benefits the wider team within your department. Get smart cards sorted out early and provide training. Again, agree the responsibilities. If you're having a system where there's one person one day, what's going to happen when they're on leave? How's it going to be covered? And also use the data that's available in Model Hospital uh, and EROC to provide feedback on success as well as also feedback where we need to change things. And importantly, celebrate the small wins. So despite all the feedback we had in our survey, I'll just leave you with this last slide, which I hope is the one I'm expecting. Um, I thought this was really good. I liked it. It kind of meant that yes, we need to carry on with this because it's the right thing for us to do for our patients and the health economy. Thank you very much. You're on mute, Kieran. I didn't want to disturb Andy in, in full <laughs> flow, <laughs> but Andy, that, that, that was a great expose of the journey of the journey that you've uh, been on over the last uh, few years. Uh, you, you referenced mistakes at the start, and I wondered what are the key message I think from you for members on the call who are embarking on this journey? Is it engagement with your GP colleagues? It's absolutely it's. It's engagement. They will engage, um, but it's really getting the voices that you need to hear in a position where you can hear them. So we undoubtedly had very keen following and engagement from our primary care representative on the ICB. We had support from the LMC once we shared the pathways and what was proposed. And those proposals were born out of stakeholder meetings. But I think what we had was the early adopters, the keen, the champions. Um, and when we've gone live, um, yes, all the ancillary medical personnel, the, the nurse practitioners, the uh, physios, they love it. They love it because it provides the information for them. But some of our senior GP colleagues, they feel that it speaks down to them, uh, which they, they don't feel comfortable with, uh, or that actually for the more junior ones, it's outside their capabilities and they don't feel comfortable. So it's, I don't quite know how you surface those voices, but those are the voices you need to engage with. And those are the ones that we're looking to get a voice heard in our next round of stakeholder engagement. Um, and I think that's going to be, that's going to be quite a long journey um, when everyone's very busy in primary care. The other thing that varies nationally is the access to pre-referral tests. And I wondered what your experience was with that and what sort of journey you've been on there. And I'd like to bring Dickie back into the conversation in a moment. Then what are you capable of getting prior to the patient seeing you in the clinic when they do need to be seen? I think what, what we agreed and what we get are two different things. 
and it depends upon the GP. We agreed some fairly basic tests, so PSA, MSU, ultrasound for scrotum or urinary problems. CTKUB is there as an agreed uh, test for possible stones or ultrasound scan where there's a possible stone. And our GPs are used to prescribing, uh, to, to requesting those. Speaking with Sarah Ramsey up in Scotland, they have a position where they're not able in primary care to request a CTKUB. So you need to know what historical arrangements there have been. And that really is where we are with the pre-investigation tests. Very basic stuff, unis, bloods, okay. ultrasound. I, but I think, Dickie, that you have managed to move this forward slightly. No, we're much the same as Andrew, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we're lucky that they, they can organise a CTKUB and we won't accept a referral for a stone patient without one. So we've got a standard response that says you need to organise a CTKUB. But we're lucky in that. But I come back to NICE guidelines. It does actually say that if you suspect renal colic, you need to get a CTKUB within 24 hours. So actually, there is a national guideline that GPs should be using, ICB should be driving, and trust should be responding to. So there's not a reason. I think the great benefit as we start to use these is there will be less inequality of care across an NGSC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Andy, moving back to you then, and more than happy to take questions from other people on the call, but uh, where are you with your PIFU journey? PIFU locally is, is pretty mature. Um, we started off again about two years ago. Um, we have got a range of PIFU pathways. I think what was important at the beginning was to recognise that you have your cancer pathways where you can follow them up remotely with asynchronous um, consultations by letter. Um, and that would be your prostate cancer, your renal cell and your complex cysts. Uh, and for some organisations using Somerset, there are a cancer uh, database. There is an add-on that you can use for your remote monitoring of your prostate cancers in a PIFU system. Um, we also have benign diseases and there we adopted a stratified uh, PIFU for the stones, exactly the same as Dickie does in Plymouth, where we've extended the length of the follow-up, we've provided them good information leaflets, they are coming back to us when they have a problem, that's avoiding the GP, so our GP colleagues are happy with that. And then we have the, the PIFU discharge, which would be uh, somebody coming for a circumcision, having a circumcision, there'll be a PIFU pathway uh, where they can have a leaflet that provides them a route back in if they have a concern, and equally the lower urinary tract patients, the overactive bladders. Okay. And if I could just tease that out a little bit more, in terms of what you've had to put in to ensure that the PIFU patient who does need to be seen doesn't go to the back of the, the queue, as it were. So I'm on a PIFU for a stone, I'm having a bit of trouble, and I want to come back and see you. What, what are the mechanisms that are employed in Shrewsbury and Telford? And I'll bring Dickie back in in a moment. It, it very much depends upon the pathway. So for the stone pathway, we have a dedicated CNS who is contactable via a particular number. For other pathways, it's back through our secretaries. Um, and I think what's really important here, and it's a conversation I have with many departments within our organisation around PIFU, the numbers that return are actually very small. So the frequent conversation is, I can't do this because there's so many follow-ups we're not seeing already. Actually, those follow-ups probably need and should be moved to PIFU already because essentially not seeing them. And actually, you will have the space and the capacity to provide an additional clinic slot should you need it for the PIFU returners because they're actually very infrequent. OK, so I think the national figure we think is somewhere in the region of 12 to 15 percent of patients on PIFU pathways will end up coming back in. And then do you keep a PIFU slot at the back end of your couple of your clinics a week? I, I will have capacity in my clinics, yes. OK, yep. right. Dickie, for, for you, the arrangement, is it through the secretary or through the CNS in the urology department or is there a generic PIFU arrangement at Plymouth? No, it's at the moment through the CNS, but being outpatient transmulation for the trust, we are considering whether we should have a central number and that central number would then send it to the right department. Slightly more complex and open for more problems, but 
one of the things we have found is that the patients invariably forget the number they've been given. Switchboard won't necessarily know it, but if they have a single PIFU number on switchboard, then that would potentially make it easier. We're not there yet, but it has something that we have considered. Yeah, it's something that we, we've looked to get traction with, but once again, we're not there with it, but we can see the advantages of going down that, that route. So it's three minutes to six o'clock. Um, thank you both for your very valuable contributions. Um, it, I think it's worthwhile for, for people on the call to look at the chat because there are a couple of links there in the chat that they can use to get into the uh, Futures NHS workspace. Um, you do need to register for that, but you can register for that with uh, with an NHS email or trust, trust email, and hopefully you'll have found the session of, of interest. Uh, we're coming back, Hamza, I think on the 11th of June at five o'clock. And uh, the plan then is to talk about uh, clinic templates. And so we're hoping to have Ian Pierce, who's the Vice President of BAS, talking about it. Uh, and Ian Erdley, who is one of the, the leads for elective transformation, also a urologist coming to give the benefit of his guidance. But it just remains for me to thank, uh, thank both uh, Dickie and Andy for their contributions this evening. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.